So the English translation for Berserk Chapter 368 just dropped today. Honestly, not a whole lot of unexpected things happened in this chapter, but there is still a number of things to discuss and analyse. Overall, I thought it was a great, solid chapter, which showcased everything we love and hate about Berserk, and it also tells us the direction the story is heading towards. Before I continue with the review, I would like to mention the sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a free MMORPG with over 56 million downloads. Play as a Telerian warrior aiming to defeat the Dark Lord. And my favourite faction is the High Elves. Their homeland, Aravia, has been around for thousands of years. Surviving the fall of the Lizardmen Empire helped the humans form into civilizations and defeated the Orcs when they formed the Huge Horde and attacked the continent. Then the Lord of Darkness convinced a bunch of Elves to go evil and attack the kingdom. The Civil War nearly ended the Elves, but Aravia survived, rebuilt, and now it's stronger than ever. My personal favourite elf is Avenger. And this month, Raid's got a non-stop schedule of special events and activities, including Forge Pass Season 3, with some rewards including a limited edition artifact set. Raid's also bringing out some new champions, along with some champion skins for the incredible Madame Cirrus. But wait, here's the big news. Later this month, Death Knight is becoming a legendary champion, and something we've all been waiting for, and I can't wait to see how Ultimate Death Knight turns out. This is the best time to get started in Raid. And if you click my link in the description or scan my QR code on the screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free Epic Champion, Aina, 200k Silver, 1 Energy Refill and 1 XP Boost and 1 Ancient Shard. Thank you Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Now back to the review. So the chapter starts off right where the previous chapter ended. When Griffith picked up Casca as these dark, evil, spirit looking things started appearing from the ground. Guts slowly picks himself up off the ground as the spirits keep chanting, sacrifice, sacrifice, and answer us. We then transition to Isidro and the rest of the gang, as they also notice the dark spirits quickly coming up to them. This is when we finally learn what these things are, kind of. Isidro and Serpico state that these are the same entities that they saw in Albion, way back in the Conviction arc. Right as one of these spirits is about to attack Isidro, something slices it, and Skull Knight after months of waiting, finally appears. I really like real life Ryan's theory that maybe these evil shadows are what enabled Alfhelm to be the magical land that it was. Kind of like a Taoist yin yang effect. Interestingly enough, Skull Knight states that he isn't able to protect everyone there, so the only option is to flee. However, Isidro states that there's no way he's going to run at a time like this, and that he's gonna stay and fight. Although this certainly does sound pretty badass, I'm not sure if it's a good idea. Maybe they should follow Skull Daddy's advice. It's frightening to see that even Skull Knight is panicking in this situation. Skull Knight also says another interesting piece of dialogue. This collapse may have been preordained, but could the undying will of man to resist also be a part of fate? I think it's pretty clear that this man that Skull Knight is referring to is Guts. It's always cool when the Chad, Skull Daddy mentions Guts in this context, with the way Guts fights and struggles against destiny and causality. We then cut to a scene with Roderick, as he quickly prepares to set sail with the rest of his crew. He can immediately tell that something is very very wrong, and that he has to leave. He narrates that a crisis is in fact befalling upon the island, and that it will be too late to just wait. And then we get what I believe to be the first comedic scene since Koji Mori became Berserk's director. We see Magnifico and Azan drunkenly state that they are going to stay on the island. It's literally only 4 panels long, as Roderick quickly hits Magnifico on the head to knock him out, before ordering him to get loaded onto the ship. This ultimately turns out to be one of the darkest chapters in recent memory, so it's interesting to see that they still tried to implement something comedic. The whole of Alfhelm then begins to shake violently, as the spirit slowly engulfs the land. Three of the crewmen are surrounded by it, and right when Roderick tells the crew to not touch it, it violently attacks them and nearly rips out all the meat in their body. Compared to all the other monsters we have seen in this story, these shadows obviously don't look very intimidating, but this scene showed that they are in fact extremely deadly. The shadows continue to engulf the land, Roderick tries to go back to the shore, but it's no good. They are completely surrounded. Even in such a dire situation, the first thing Roderick thinks about is Fani. 
wondering if she is safe. Honestly, I really hope that Guts and the rest of the crew do not go back inside the boat, because remember the last time that happened, and how long they were in the boat for? Yeah, I really hope that we don't have a second boat arc. Anyway, the chapter transitions back to Guts as he stands up. He looks up and sees Zod flying upwards. Griffith, the person who had led him to go into this vengeful journey, has taken the person he loved the most. It's indescribable how sad and demoralizing the scene is. Back in chapter 130, after Godo had kicked Guts in the pants about how he had abandoned the only thing he had left in his life, Guts made a declaration with himself that he will never lose her again. But in this scene, he does lose her. Even after all the shit Guts went through to take Casca back, and even after this massive journey it took to bring Casca to Alfhelm to restore her memory, Griffith is able to simply take her away. And we can visibly see Guts' whole world crumble right in front of him in these pages. Although a few of the panels do look slightly wonky, I think the team did a solid job portraying this defeated type of emotion in this scene. One minor detail I saw someone else pointing out is how Griffith's hand is slightly touching Casca's breast. Which makes me wonder, is this drawn intentionally and is Griffith doing this in a way to taunt Guts, like he did during the eclipse? If he really is doing this intentionally, I'm going to say for the thousandth time, fuck Griffith. We are all more than tired of seeing Guts so fucking destroyed and screwed over all the time. But then again, it's also this part of Guts which makes us love Berserk so much. On the next close-up of Casca's face, it appears that she is opening her eyes, and that she may be regaining consciousness. This has some implications for the next chapter, because it could suggest that we'll see her and Griffith talk to each other again for the first time since before the eclipse, which was a heck of a long time ago. Guts reaches his hand out at what he has now lost. This is probably my favourite panel in this whole chapter. I also like the detail that Zod flying away looks similar to the White Hawk we have previously seen in the story. The whole of Alfhelm continues to shake, but it appears that some boulders are landing around Guts. It doesn't look like an ordinary earthquake. And the chapter closes with Park overlooking the whole commotion from the skies. The story really did go from 0 to 100 extremely quickly, in vintage berserk fashion. This may have been my favourite chapter so far since Koji Mori took over. I swear I say this in every chapter review, but for sure the next chapter is going to be extremely pivotal for the whole story, and it's set to be released on the second week of September. Make sure you subscribe to watch my review for that. Thank you for watching.